each other, Father God in heaven, we come again, Father God, in your name, thanking you for another privilege, another honor, another great opportunity to come before you. Lord, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for this, another opportunity to study your word. We realize, Father God, that we have not, have not measured up. We have fallen short. We've messed up. We've not done the things that are pleasing in your sight. We ask you to forgive us, Lord. Bless us, Father God, to walk in your will and your way. And bless us to know you in a very real way. Lord, we ask you to bless us as we come before your word tonight. That your word will be clear. Your word will be accurate. Your word will be relevant. That men, women, boys, and girls will listen to your word be convicted, be convinced, and be converted. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless us now. Speak to us as only you can. It's in the promising, powerful, anointed name of Jesus Christ, we pray and we ask it all. Amen. And thank God. He is the light of the world. Jesus is. Jesus the light of the world. He is, Jesus is. Jesus, the light of the world. Yes, he is. He is. He is the light. He is the light of the world. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Thank you so much for joining us here tonight for our Bible study. You've joined us again tonight, and we are excited. We are excited about the Bible study tonight, I want to say to you, don't hang up on me. I want to say to you tonight, it's geared toward you, even if you don't think it is. Our Bible study for tonight is Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 through 21. Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 through 21. I beg of you again, regardless of your status, Regardless of what your status is going to be or is not going to be, let's stay focused in Bible study tonight. I challenge you to stay focused that you will be blessed of the Lord. Tonight's Bible study is geared toward the family. And I want to say to the ladies and to the men tonight, if you are not married, this lesson is for you. If you are married, this lesson is for you. If you beyond the stage where you know you're not going to get married, this lesson is for you. So don't hang up on me. Don't, don't shut me down. Don't shout me down before I get started. I want to say uh, God has strategically placed you in this lesson for tonight. So uh, regardless of your marital status, regardless of your family lifestyle, let's look at the word and let the word of God speak to us. Tonight's, uh, tonight's lesson deals with the Christian family, the family that is walking after Christ, the Christian family. There may be a need for someone to confess their sins to God tonight, and there may be some instruction for you tonight. I beg of you, don't hang up on me. <laughs> Stick with it and stay with it. We want to talk about the Word of God. It is the Word of God. Let the Word of God reveal itself to you. Amen? About 10 years ago, Almost to the date, almost to the, no, 20 years ago, almost to the date, 20 years ago, I had the privilege of performing a renewing of the vows. I had the privilege of performing a wedding after a couple had been married 10 years. This couple is near and dear to me. The audience knew that the, the groom and I were friends. We were close. We were not only just close friends, but we were co-workers. We were on the same shifts. When I went on night shift, he was on night shift. When I went on day shift, he was on day shift. When I was off on my four-day trip, he was off on his four-day journey. We worked four on, four off, four nights on, four nights off. We were very close friends. And because we were very close friends, I was the one chosen to do the renewal of the vows. 
And I was just reading right down through my book. I, I had not I had not thought something would come up. I had not thought something would would be a be a glitch in the wedding ceremony. But when I began to read to the wife, I'd already read to the man, and the man had already repeated after me. I blank blank do solemnly swear, swear to love and protect her and comfort her in good and in bad as long as we both shall live. I promise and I pledge to her, whether it's in sickness and in health, I'll be there for her. I will be there for her, whether it's in poor or in wealth, I will be there for her. And it went across with the groom without a hitch. But when I got to the wife, and in this case, a wife who had been married to the same man for 10 years, a great couple, and they, they shared with me today about 6 o'clock today that I had the freedom to share their story. This wife, a Houston police officer at that time, this wife, one who went to houses and made demands. This wife struggled when we got to the part about submission. She was repeating after me and it was going so well. She, she said that, that I promise to, in sickness and in health, and I promise in poorness and in wealth, I, I promise to be there for him, whether we are, we are rich or poor. I, I promise to be there until death do us part. And I'm just reading the book. And when I got to that point where it says, and I promise to obey him. My book says obey. It doesn't say submit. But I got to that part where it said, I promise to obey him. And she looked at me as to say, preacher, aren't you going to change that word? So I repeated myself. I promise, and she's supposed to repeat after me. I promise to obey him. And she just stared at me. She didn't look at the groom. She didn't look at the audience. She stared at me. So now I'm going to try it a second time. I promise to obey him. And she stared at me, did not, she wasn't rebellious, she did not throw her hat, she did not go crazy, she didn't get loud, she just stared at me. By now, the audience is staring at her. I said, let me try it again. I promise to obey him. And finally, with her teeth held together, she says, I promise to obey him. And then we were, on, we were able to get on with the ceremony. We were able to go from there to the celebration. And everything was lovely from that point on. After I had to really pull it out of her to obey him. That's why our lesson begins tonight. It says... Colossians chapter 3, verse number 18, it deals with the wife first. Remember, this is a Christian family. This word wife means woman. This word wife means female. This word wife says to us that it was a woman born a girl, and now she's a woman, and now she's about to be a wife, or she has become a wife. In verse number 18, Colossians chapter 3 says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Maybe, maybe I just need to tell you that I'm reading the New King James Version. And so let me read it again. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Let me unpack that a little bit. First of all, there's an order of creation. God created Adam 
and then from Adam's rib, he created the woman. It did not matter if this woman was a Houston police officer or not. She had a husband, and bless the Lord, they're getting ready to celebrate 31 years. And even though she speaks and citizens do what she says, when her husband speaks, she literally did what he said and still is 20 years later. So the text says, wives submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Let me unpack it. First of all, God created the man and then he created the woman. There's a divine order. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, God gives that divine order. He says, first of all, Woman was created, man was created rather, then woman, and then the children. So he says, there is God the Father, there is God the Son, there is the man, there is the woman, then there are the children. So there is an order in which we ought to submit. Let me get to it. Don't, don't shut me down right now. Don't shut me down. As Christ submits to God. The woman ought to submit to the man. Yes. Let me let me let me make sure I lay this out well because I I know we have email, I know we have Facebook, I know you have Instagram that I don't deal with, but I know you're gonna put me on blast. So let me make sure I read the word and unpack the word. This word submit means to be subordinate to. It does not mean to be inferior to. This word submit means to bring yourself under. It is the same word we get the word submarine as it means to find yourself underwater in the submarine. So women, let me just say to you today, it's not a, it's not a demeaning word. It's not a, a deter, it's not a word that you need to run from. Matter of fact, what God is saying here is that woman duck so God can hit the man with the brick. In other words, God holds the man responsible, and since God holds him responsible, then women, you just submit and let God handle the man. You know, early in my marriage, I, I was kind of I was kind of feisty. But over a period of time, you get to a point where you understand. So what happens is many times men want to make her submit, but you can't make her submit. She has to have a willing spirit to submit. Many have said that the man is the president of the house and the wife is the vice president. I say many have said that the man is the president and the wife is the vice president. Well, you do know that uh, vice president-elect Kamala Harris ran for president. Vice president, which is president-elect Joe Biden, is now the president-elect and, and Kamala Harris is vice president-elect. So she is there to carry out what the president says. Even though she ran for president because she became vice president, and at this point elect, since she became vice president, she understands really well that the president stands and speaks and she's under him. Yes, it's not a de derogatory word because check this out. Vice president... Kamala Harris is the first African-American woman, the first woman of Indian descent, and the first successful woman to become vice president. She makes history. Let me just say to you tonight, women, go ahead and make history. <laughs> make history with your submission. The word submission is not a word you need to shy away from. Wives must submit 
in order for the whole household to run well. The word submission is a word that gives that leader respect. Mm -hmm. Women, if you ever want to find a mad, angry man, then disrespect him. Oh, yeah. if, 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 a man, if a man feels disrespected, mm -hmm. he may be in his feelings that day. But if he feels disrespected, you will either feel the backlash or he will shut down. Households cannot operate well and godly when the woman is disrespectful to the man. Look at all the men saying hallelujah. I saw hearts and, and thumbs up popping up everywhere just then. I'm, I mean, men who have never said amen. Men who have never given me a thumbs up. Men who have never said yes, pastor, preach are saying yes, pastor, preach. The word submission it's not a derogatory word. It's, it's a word that means that I respect this man enough to honor him as he leads our family. It warns us tonight. Don't go and grab Joe Blow off the street just because he's tall, dark, and handsome or because he speaks like Barry White or because he's bow-legged. You want to know what's on the inside of that man. Because God is going to hold you responsible for following him. So it takes a godly woman to submit under a godly man. So this word submit is not a tough word. It's not the wives must submit. Look at what it says. Only to their own husbands. Wives, wives have to submit to their own husbands. I've said to the members of the New Beginning Church and the women who are married there, don't bring me a cup of water if you don't bring the man at the house a cup of water. I've said to men and I've said to women, I don't want your wife submitting to me more than they submit to you at the house. No woman should submit to their boss man more than they submit to their husband. No woman should submit to their pastor more than they submit to the man at the house. Mm -hmm. Ooh, look at God. Wives submit only to your own husband. Look at what it says. I'm reading New King James. Wives submit to your own husband as is fitting in the Lord. He says a couple of things here. Number one, submit to your own husband because this is fitting in the Lord. Yes. And then he says, submit to your own husband as is fitting in the Lord. For he's also saying, as the husband is spiritual, you follow him. Amen. He says, it's right there in the text. It says, as is fitting to the Lord. Whenever the husband is leading you in a direction that is not fitting to the Lord, you are of no obligation to follow him. Yeah. You heard that? He said, whoops. In other words, as he follows God, you follow him. So we want to follow the husband leadership. And if there's any conflict, we want to support him by the word of God. Now, women, that doesn't mean because you don't mess around and grab somebody that's not spiritual, you don't respect him. If he's your husband, don't get out of it. Stay there because Paul says you can win this guy over with your chase conversation, your chase lifestyle. You can win him over in your walk with the Lord. Boy, he, in this verse, he just tells the woman, woman, submit to your own husband and submit to him as he is submitting to the Lord. Verse number 19 talks to the men. Okay. And these are men who were born men. They are male men. They weren't made men. They were born by God as men. 
He says, husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Says husband, husband. First of all, it says to us, husbands, men, love your wife. And love is an action word. Husbands, love your wife as Christ has loved the church in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. Love your wife as Christ has loved the church. Now, I want to say to you men, love your own wife. My, my, my. Husbands, love your wife and do not be bitter toward them. Do, exercise loving relationships and loving leadership. Brothers, it takes a spiritual man to lead a spiritual woman. I think I'll say that again. Brothers, it takes a spiritual man in order to lead a spiritual woman. Yes. Now, if you got a woman that's sp not spiritual and you're not spiritual, I don't know how to answer that. Mm -hmm. But the text declares that the husband ought to love their wives as Christ has loved the church. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. We ought to love our wives so much so until we're willing to give our lives for them. Christ gave his life for his bride, the church. We ought to love our wives as Christ loved the church. And love ought to be something of action. Well, love them. They ought not, they ought not wonder if we love them. Some wives like flowers. Some wives don't like flowers. There are five different love languages. You need to find out what her love language is and key in on that love language. Yes, yeah, Sister David's got a love language. Let me just tell you, girl. Man, let me tell you. She got a love language. And it's obvious. I didn't have to ask her. We didn't have to debate about it. We didn't have to have a meeting about it. She has a love language, and one of those love languages is acts of service. You want me to tell you what act of service is? Act of service means the more I work, the harder I work, she just get love out of it. She just love to see me busy, love to see me working, and man, it just turns her on and get her driving. The harder I work. So I've labeled myself the workhorse around here. I, I, I'm, I'm the workhorse. I'm, I'm the workhorse. I'm the horse that pulls, pulls that, that bell, plow that field. That's her love language. If I bring flowers, it's okay. But I mean, mop the floor, take the trash out, load those instruments. I mean, she's sitting on a high because that's her love language. Some women's love language is touch. Some women's love language is act of service. What's the rest of them? Some women love love language is uh, speaks positive things to her. Let her know how pretty she is. Let her know how you appreciate her. Act of appreciation. Brothers, you have to find out their love language and don't let it go. Stick with it. I know I'm always be in good shape. I'm, I'm going to always be in good shape because of my wife's love language. It says, brothers, love your wives as Christ loved the church. So we must exercise loving relationship and loving leadership, not a dictatorship of a dictatorship of dominion. Husbands have to be reminded because we didn't come here with a book. We got the Bible now. Husbands have to be reminded to be tender, to be loving, and to take good care. Oh, what marriages would be like. Oh, what courtship would be like if the man just knew 
how to handle her with tender, loving care. If the man learns to make sure that he handles her well, then she will not usurp his authority. When, when you really want to see a mad man, he's really mad. I mean, he's out of his mind when he feels like the woman has usurped or gone around his authority or gone behind his back and made a commitment that he did not want to make, she decided to make it. She usurped his authority. I mean, if, if Sister David did me like that, my hair would grow. <laughs> then, brothers, we have to understand that absolute authority reigning over woman will embitter that woman. Look at what it says. It says, husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. What is saying, don't make this woman bitter with the way you try to lord over her. If she's married to you, she's already been reared. Her parents have already reared her. And if she's not reared, you can't do it. It says, just love them. Exercise love. Exercise tender, loving care. Boy, the women just popping up now. The heart's here. Thumbs up here. Yeah, go ahead, preacher. Amen. I haven't seen so many women pop up with amen, 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 since I've been talking about verse number 19. <laughs> Husband, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. What he's saying is don't, don't be harsh toward them. Find a way to love them. Let me just share with you, brothers. When God created a woman, he did better than he could ever do when it comes to creation. When he created a monkey and a baboon, that did that was good. But when he created man and woman, that was very good. And brothers, I would much rather be with a woman than a baboon. I would much rather be with a woman than another man. It says, love them says, show them love. Don't be a dictator over them. Don't be one who forces them to dislike you. This word means that the wives have to be sensitive and the men has to be sensitive and wives are nothing more than a tender, sensitive flower. You have to treat that flower with gentleness. And when you treat the flower with gentleness, boy, I'm, I'm, I'm covering about 10,000 counseling sessions right now. When you treat that flower with gentleness, with tender, loving care, it blossoms, it blooms. Brothers, if, if you're coming home and, and she, she hates to see you coming, check yourself. Every time she sees you and she turns her nose up, check yourself. Ask yourself, why isn't she willing to submit? Is it because I'm trying to force her to submit? You can't force grown people to do anything. You have to treat them with love. And if she still doesn't want to come around, she's still a hellion, God is going to take God to do it. <laughs> Treat them with compassion. Treat them with care. And the Bible teaches that the wife will respond to you and be willing to submit to you if you do not embitter her. That's in the text. It's in the Bible. It says, be a loving leader. We need men who are willing to lead God's way. We need women who are willing to submit as God has asked them to. Yes. Because verse 20 says to the children, children obey your parents in all things. Now here it is, the children watching the parents. And I don't 
care whether they say it or not. They are watching you and whatever vibes you're giving off, they see it. They feel it. They're sensitive to it. So as we're on one accord, the children know that we're on one accord. And you can tell, the children can tell you when their parents are on one accord because they will say stuff like, Daddy, can I do this? And you will say, what your mama say? That's how they did it back home with me. What did your mama say? Well, she said, ask you. And what it is, is they both have to totally agree that we can do whatever we want to do. And if they don't agree, we got to have a family meeting. And the family meeting is, well, where, what harm is going to take? Well, what, what, is gonna, what is it going to be? So he says, children, obey your parents in all things. There are children who have some parents that they don't think are great parents but they have a roof over their head. They're not being abused. They're not being left out. The Bible says, obey them. Yes. Here I am, almost 60 years old, three, well, two and a, two and a fourth year from, from, 59, from 58, and at 57, I still have to obey what mama says. Yes. And I don't have to, be brow browbeated to do it. I understand that respect toward mama enlarges my days, increases my days, give me more valuable and more prosperity in my days. Children, obey your parents in all things. This is the first commandment with promise in Exodus. In the in the in the 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 in the great the Ten Commandments, it says with the it's the first promise that we have. It's the first commandment with promise. If you obey, children, obey your parents. Obey this word. Obey is the same word. We get the word submit, means to come up under. It bothers me when I see children interacting with their parents today. I didn't have the privilege of interacting with my parents as these children do today. They didn't have to say obey me. We knew to obey them. Because it only took one of the four of us one time to disobey and it was on like popcorn. And they didn't care who in the neighborhood knew it. But now we have children telling parents what they're not going to do. I remember right well, at the age of 17, I decided to sign up for the Air Force. I decided I was going to sign up at school. The Air Force came by. The Army came by. I wanted to go to the Air Force because I, th I thought they were well-dressed and they were smart. So I decided to sign up and, and pre-enroll in the Air Force at age 17. That night, I went home and I told my daddy, I signed up and I enlisted in the Air Force. I, I, got a, I got a graduate from high school, so they let me sign up. It was pre-enrollment. They let me sign up. Daddy said, no, you ain't going nowhere. And guess what? I had to unsign up. When Daddy said I wasn't going, it was over. There was no discussion. There was no back and forth. He didn't even have to give me a reason. Because in our household, when daddy and mama spoke, it's just as bad as the president and the vice president speaking. There was a slogan out one time, when E.F. Hudden speak, people listen. In our household, when Mathis Davis speak, people do. And they do it without a discussion. So I say to you, modern day, 21st century children, children, obey your parents in the Lord. Submit to your parents in the Lord in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. We want to please the Lord, don't we? Yes. We want the Lord to be pleased with us. Young people, we want the Lord to be pleased with us. And I'm talking to some grown young people now. 
See, people get to an age where they think they're grown, but you will never be growner than your parents. I'm talking to some grown folk right now. Grown, grown folk got to be submissive to their parents. You think your parents are old foggy. You think they're losing their mind. You think they're suffering from senility. You think they're suffering from dementia. You have to be respectful to them and come under their leadership and obedience even when you're grown. My mother and my mother-in-law get the utmost respect from me. They come to our house, do what they want to do. We go to their house and we do what they want us to do. Because we know our days will be long upon the land which the Lord thou God has given us. Yes. Children, obey your parents in all things. How many things? All things. In Jamaica, all means all. In Spain, all means all. In the United States, all means everything. In Greek, it means all. In Hebrew, it means all. Obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. The Lord will be well-pleasing. Final note for tonight in verse number 21. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Fathers, do not provoke your children. Do not. It tells the men to not provoke your children. It is the same word when it talks about not being harsh to the wife. It means to not embitter them. Do, do not force them to dislike you and to discourage them. Always refrain from agitating your children. Do not make unreasonable demands of your children. Your children are jewels. It doesn't matter if they got here with two mamas and daddy presents or not. It doesn't matter if they got here by a single parent or not. They are jewels. They are pearls. God has blessed you with them. It says do not exaggerate them. Do not frustrate them because they will become discouraged. And let me tell you, whenever you have a discouraged child, he or she cannot do well in school. He or she cannot do well in, in social circles. He or she is always looking over their backs because you have caused them to be fearful. It says don't provoke them. Don't mistreat them. Don't push them. We have to praise them for doing well rather than constantly criticizing them. We can't remind them of every time they mess up. We have to remind them of the things they do well and do good. We have to always remind them. Help them to be reared up by giving them the instructions of the Lord says, fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Fathers, fathers, spend time with them. You know, it's a bad father, I just will say this, it's a bad father who never spend time with their children but always want to beat them and tell them what to do. It's not a good father who will provoke their children and never spend time with them. I'm not talking about the check. I'm not talking about child support. That's left up to you and the, the attorney general office. Every man ought to pay child support. Every man ought to take care of his own child. Every man ought to be responsible for his own children. But when you don't spend time with them, you're provoking them to follow the ruleship of somebody else. And it may not be a good leader or a good ruler. It says, don't provoke them. Don't push them. Don't push them away from God. And don't push them away from you. You see, children look at their fathers and that's the biggest God they see. And if they see God in you, 
then they would know what God looks like. But if you're always on top of them, uh, criticizing them, provoking them to wrath and provoking them to do things and, and added demands upon them, that's how they see God. They see God as a big old person in heaven that's already always looking to get them, to beat upon them, to provoke them, to fight back. But we have a loving God. Yes. And the God who loves us showed his love for us. And that's the kind of daddy we ought to want to be. We don't want to provoke our children to wrath. We want to always encourage them, build them up. When they fall, we let them know, I hate to know that you've fallen, but I can help you get up again. Yes. It is the picture of a little boy riding or a little girl riding their training bike for the first time. And the first time they're riding good and they go to take a turn and that training bike turns over, straight their cheek, straight their knees. Does a good father say, get up, you better, you better than that. Get up, you bum. Or is it a good father that says, come. Even with a boy, come and let me rub salve on your wounds. That's what God did. We ought to have the picture of God. Children ought to see the picture of God in every father. God rubs salve on Jesus is the bomb. In this word, bomb means sad. This word, sad, is the ointment. This word, ointment, ointment is the medicated cure. The Bible says Jesus is the bomb in Gilead that makes the wounded well. God so loved us <laughs> that he gave us the bomb in Gilead. His name is Jesus. He did that over 2,000 years ago. He gave his very best for his children. Jesus is God's very best. We were on our way to hell. We couldn't afford to die. And we were too mean to live. But over 2,000 years ago, God the Father. Set an example for every father. He gave us Jesus, the medication, the balm in Gilead that saves the wounded soul. That's something to shout about. Thank God for Jesus. And for those of you who do not have a father in your life, let me tell you, God the Father loves you. He offers a wonderful plan for your life. God the Father loves you so much until he gave his only begotten son for you and for me. Jesus died for you over 2,000 years ago. They killed him. Mean men killed him. Mean men nailed his wrist. Mean men spiked his feet. Mean men raised him up and they had him on a cross. Jesus died for you. Because of this great loving God we have, Jesus died on the cross for you. Saying Jesus, they took off the cross, laid him in a borrowed tomb. It was a borrowed tomb. It was Joseph's brand new tomb. It was a borrowed tomb. That same Jesus got up early that third day morning with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. If you're here with me tonight and you haven't tried that Jesus that we talk about, the Jesus that we sing about, the Jesus that we shout about, this is your moment. You can get to know him tonight just believe the story that Jesus died for your sins. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. But early that third day morning, he rose with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. 
That same Jesus who rose from the dead can save your life tonight. God, the loving Father, is saying, come. He's not provoking us to wrath. He is provoking us to be saved. As any good father would, we want the best for our children. Our Father God says, come. Come unto him. The door is open. The invitation is extended. As we submit to Jesus, and Jesus submits to God, we got to get to know him. You need to come to Jesus just as you are. I hear you. You're saying, but preacher, you don't know what I've done. I say to you, regardless of what you've done, come to Jesus. He loves you. He will forgive you if you just trust the story. If you'd like to get to go to heaven, if you'd got, like to get to know this God we're talking about, I want you to bow your head with me and repeat after me and invite Jesus Christ into your life. A little simple prayer, just repeat after me and, and invite him to come into your life so you can go to heaven when you die. So you can live peacefully with mankind and peacefully with God while you're here. If you would, just bow your head with me and invite him into your life. Repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe if you honestly prayed that prayer, believing the story that Jesus died and rose again, we believe that you're going to heaven when you die. We believe that you are born again. We believe that you are a brand new person. If you receive Christ tonight, just inbox me and let me know that you've received Jesus. And we can rejoice together of your newfound connection with God. And for those of you who are sinners, who've fallen short, who messed up like me, and we keep on messing up, I want to pray with you and ask God to, to put you on straight street. I want to pray with you that sin will not overshadow you. For those of you who are discouraged, those of you who are fighting being locked up during this pandemic. It's enough to mess up your mind. I want to pray with you and pray for you. For those of you who are struggling with sickness, those of you who are struggling with family issues, those of you who are struggling with, with life, I just want to pray that God heals you and keeps you and bless you. Will you join me in prayer? Father God, we come lifting these before you. We pray that you bless them and keep them. We pray, Father God, that you bind up their wounds. Heal their bodies. Heal their minds. Be a blessing to them like no one else can. We ask you to put families together. We ask you to comfort them during times like these. Bless them in the midst of loneliness. Be their comfort. Be their company keeper. And Lord, we ask you to bless with jobs. And bless with hope. Bless with strength to move on. Bless lives to be walked in unity. Bring some wayward child home. Bless somebody who's prodigal to come back to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. 
Amen and thank God. Let me thank you for joining us here at the New Beginning Church. If you're in between church homes or you don't have a church home, I recommend the New Beginning Church. You can join online, just inbox me and let me know that you want to be part of the New Beginning Church. And we'll be glad to take you in and celebrate. Many have come to join during, during this pandemic time. We welcome you to the New Beginning Church. So inbox me and let me know that you would like to be a member of the New Beginning Church. It is offering time. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. Let us rejoice. It is time to give to the Lord. It's a blessing to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It is time to give to the Lord. God has blessed us, and God will continue to bless us as we continue to sacrifice, even during these times. You can give by three means. You can give by Cash App. Our Cash App is dollar sign NBC Souls, cash tag NBC Souls, or you can give by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com, lifting.jesus at yahoo.com, or you can give by mail. You can mail your offering to the New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. So please, ma'am, please, sir, uh, continue to give. We, we don't give because we're in church. We give because of our fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So continue to give. Even though we're not meeting, we're, we're meeting by way of Zoom and by way of of Facebook Live. Come on, be a part of the giving congregation that will continue to give unto the Lord. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service on tonight. Thank you for, for continuing to walk with us and being with us here on tonight. So we look forward to you continuing to walk with us by way of a Bible study and Sunday school. We're looking forward to you tuning in to these same stations on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. and also for our church service at 10.30 a.m. every Sunday morning. Continue to, to tune in with us. And thank you again tonight for being a part of our service on tonight for our Bible study. Please, ma'am, please, sir, inbox me and let me know that you need prayer, or give me a testimony of how good, how good God has been to you. Looking forward to rejoicing with you anytime, anywhere, any place. Thank you so much for joining us. We at the New Beginning Church, we are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John chapter 12, verse 32. Let us go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for another privilege, another opportunity, another chance, Father God, just to hear your word. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless every person who has heard this word, who will hear this word. We pray, Father God, that you continue to walk with us and be a blessing to us and that we will run and tell men, women, boys, and girls about the God we serve in the goodness that he has given toward us. It's in the name of Jesus the Christ we pray and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. We look forward to seeing you on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for our Sunday school and at 1045 for our regular Sunday morning service. God bless you and God keep you. Until next time, be blessed and we're looking forward to a great time in the Lord.